Did you ever have more than seven bamboo strikes? No, no, seven's the max. Uh, yeah. Frankly, it, it bakes my noodle to try and memorize seven numbers as it is, or symbols. I'm at the absolute limit of my intellectual capacity. I don't know about you. Doing three buttons, you're like, ah, oh, no problem. Yeah. Five, still no problem. Somehow adding in two more, that's the limit of human beings. Yeah, it's like- or the like the edge of what a human being can do. It's like that whole, like, you can only remember 200 faces thing or something, you know, like you can only remember a certain amount of books you've read. It's like eight symbols and then the whole society falls apart. Hello and welcome to No Clip. I am your host, Danny O'Dwyer, and this week I'm delighted to be joined by two of the gentlemen uh, who are responsible for bringing out Ghosts of Tsushima, which came out just about a month ago. Um, hopefully the dust has settled and they can uh, uh, open up their hearts and minds to us here and talk about uh, what made this game so special and what made it such a killer uh, at retail. 2.4 million copies in three days, and uh, it seems like it's only getting more and more popular uh, in, in our community for sure. Uh, let me introduce the two folks we're going to be talking to today. First of all, uh, co-creative director uh, Nate Fox. Uh, thank you so much for making the time to talk to us today. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Of course. And uh, uh, art director and co-creative director, Jason Connell, uh, thank you uh, as well for, for making the time. How are you doing? Doing great. Uh, I'm glad to be here. This is exciting. Uh, so we've been talking to a lot of people uh, over the past couple of months, uh, interviewing devs who are sort of dealing with quarantine, but we haven't talked to anyone who launched a AAA game uh, in June, which I imagine was perhaps the worst possible timing for how everything went down. Uh, what? How have the past couple of months been like for you guys? I know you're a month from launch now, but what was that final run to the end like? You know, uh, ironically, uh, it helped us focus. I mean, it was crazy and obviously difficult for everyone to make the switch to working from home. And these are pretty tough times. But when you're trying to really mine the details and fix all the minute aspects of a game, having everyone in an isolated quiet room where you can just focus <laughs> and make each little part perfect, it was a good thing. And Ghost was better for it. I would never have guessed that that would be the case, but it ended up being that way. Yeah, did, did, I imagine, or what do you think about this being more of an issue perhaps during the earlier phase of a game? Like when you're trying to ideate and, you know, be in creative meetings and come up with ideas. Do you think it's more of an issue perhaps at that stage of development? Yeah, it's a lot harder to have whiteboard meetings uh, over the internet or um, have somebody come up with a prototype and they hand the controller to you and you say, well, maybe 20% faster, which <laughs> that kind of thing happens all the time early in game development. And so certainly uh, I think that the industry is challenged by working remotely when you're at the start of something. Yeah, what, what's it like been like for you guys as well in Bellevue? I mean, you're, you're the whole country, the whole world's having a massive uh, issue, obviously with the working from home stuff, but then there's the added stress of what's been going on in Seattle, I imagine. The, has that been just part of the, the haze of this whole time or was it particularly difficult on the team given the sort of proximity to all that? No, I, I feel like uh, the the pandemic world of chaos uh, has has definitely thrown us all for, I mean, everyone has been affected by it, some certainly more than others. I think one of the uh, weird up, I guess uh, you could say an upside of, you know, both releasing a game during this time and um, also being maybe a, a game developer is that you have a little bit of an outlet to focus on and some, right. some of the noise around the world. You don't ignore it. It's hard to ignore that stuff. You know, you don't want to ignore it. It's real stuff, but it gives you a little bit of a release and an outlet, even though some of the stuff may be happening in our, our own backyards. Um, it's, it's, it's a, you know, you asked earlier about, you know, what's it like shipping a game, you know, in this period of time. And I think that uh, being able to, uh, in a weird, in a weird way, you know, you're always in an office and there's huge upsides to being in the office with your friends, you know, making decisions as Nate pointed out, being able to hold the controller, but there's something 
nice about being able to be at home and playing the game in a weird way on your own TV in your living room, which makes it you see it in a completely, totally different way really? than you would have you know, before. Yeah, because you're a dev kit, you're ne- you're just in this different environment. You actually get to be almost it's not the same, but almost like from a consumer's perspective. And um, you, you definitely get the, the the lighthearted feeling of being able to play a game, which is kind of nice given the, the the complexities of the world right now yeah on the other side of that um transaction i've really relished my time with the game and i just want to let people know we're not going to go deep into story spoilers or any of that sort of stuff uh late game stuff i've only just entered act three last night um but it's been the type of game that i've been really relishing i've been trying not to because I, I burned myself the whole way through Last of Us to try and get to the end to see how because I wanted to know how the story ended and and in a way I felt like I perhaps um burned myself out on that but I've just been enjoying being in this world um have you heard that from people what, what's been the feedback from fans uh f- from new fans or old fans on the game how how have people been been playing it have you gotten that sense that they're that they're you know playing it for a long time because it's not it's not short either there's a lot to do well, the game is designed not to be uh, one story, but to be an anthology of stories and also to get players to go off and explore. While Jin has this arc that he goes on, we really want players, we hope players will uh, get distracted by something on the horizon and just follow their curiosity. Really, that's where the game is the most alive. So. We have been hearing that people uh, kind of find themselves uh, getting uh, following threads that they didn't expect and right. being more of a completionist than they have in other games. And that's just a great compliment, I think, because it says that uh, the world is is basically pleasant to be in, that there's enough content to reward that curiosity. And particularly at this time, when all of us are stuck inside, the prospect of being able to just cruise around on a horse and find <laughs> hidden things in a beautiful environment it's it's very appealing mm-hmm. uh, let's talk about that environment then let's kind of dive into that because one of the things that our community often wants to know about is um from a really broad perspective how an open world is sort of designed at the start uh like mm-hmm. how do you from you know the early days of building this game figure out that you want to have a world of a certain size or certain amounts of you know points of interest uh one aspect of this game uh, in terms of its world design is the sort of hard locking of the different parts of the island so that you have that i guess slow um reveal for players so like going back to the earlier stages of, of this project how did you conceptualize that is it the type of thing that's iterated on a lot or do you kind of have to f- find out what that is and lock it in early yeah, maybe Nate talk about the the story stuff because part of that locking is definitely story related. Um, but there's a lot of work that goes into uh, the size and the scope and this you know the scale of the world. You know, um, we say you know content density. What's what's the density of content that you want? How far should you ride in any direction before do you, you find something? And you're never going to get that right the first time, or the second, <laughs> or the third. You know, so it's it's a constant iteration um, and 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 then it's just like this handshake back and forth with design and the environment art team, um, because I'll tell you that uh, the first um, iterations of Tsushima, especially the lower portion of Tsushima, Tsushima, uh, it was very dense with fo- uh, foliage and trees. I mean, it was so thick and very cool. It was this completely other you know feeling, but it was so dense and so thick that. You, it was sometimes hard to actually figure out where you were. You know, there was not there was not as near as many giant clearings where you could kind of see you know, the, the shrine climb or the mountain up ahead or that or or at the time we didn't have you know smokestacks that would kind of like draw you in, um, but you certainly wouldn't have been able to see it even if we had it. Um, and so as we started, you know, kind of figuring out what that density is, what the right amount of density is for our, for our game that balances being okay with getting lost in the world and having a moment to just not be completely saturated. Mm. Um, but also so much though that, you know, if somebody is looking for something, it's not too long before they find something unique. Once we figure that out, then we kind of went through the world and started clearing areas out that were not being used as much to try to create 
a nicer, um, first of all, aesthetic palette. It looks, I think it looks much better. It has a sense of freedom to it when you get into these open fields. Um, gives you like a, a sense of feeling like I can figure out what I want to do next, not the game telling me, uh, which is nice. And so, you know, that takes many years up until, you know, the last year of development, we were like making those you know, balancing choices. Yeah. And then Nate, from a story perspective, obviously the, the story, uh, like many open world games is, you know, paramount in, in getting players to explore parts of the island, uh, that they need to go to and then sort of like nudging them in other directions that perhaps that they, they wouldn't go otherwise. Um, yeah. Can you talk about how you structured the story? Cause obviously there's been a lot of reporting about the, the influences of, uh, Akira Kurosawa and, and a lot of the, um, wonderful sort of, uh, texts as well that have come out of, um, J Japan about that era. But, you know, from, a, ga a game is so much different than a movie. I, I mean, you know, Seven Samurai is not a short film, but it, it, there's a lot more story in Ghost of Tsushima than there is in a in a Kurosawa movie. So, yeah, how did you approach it? You know, given the the influences, but how do you translate that into um, into a, a story that's special, or kind of like several stories that's special? Because I I fell in love with each of the characters in their own way, and they all felt like almost like side like different episodes in a series or something. I'm glad you felt that way. It certainly was our ambition to achieve that. Um, we wanted the narrative to be broad, that it wasn't just Jin's story, that it was also Sensei Ishikawa's and Lady Masako, uh, Norio, these characters that you would meet along the way that had their own problems, their own goals and desires that would flesh out uh, the response of the people of Tsushima to their home being invaded. And when you start the game, you tend to think about things through the lens of kind of linear storytelling because we're all used to watching movies or uh, reading comics or books. But because it's an open world game, it's, it's pretty challenging. We don't get to control the pace at which you encounter those story beats, the players in control. We don't uh, get to dictate um, Really, I mean, that's the, that's the big one is just pacing or and often order. So right. we have to look for some way, if possible, to create a beginning, middle, and an end so that you have a satisfying uh, narrative conclusion. And that's why we do things like a big uh, geometry locking events. So this game features uh, a few really kind of uh, large moments where you transition from one area of the map to another so that Jin can go through moments of transformation where he's making choices that he can't walk back. He's having experiences that can't be undone. And so when you go into the new area, you uh, get to be in a space that feels fresh and different. And the way that people react to you is uh, different as well. So you're not feeling like you're just swimming through the same water to, to it's kind of a bad metaphor, but right. No, I hear what you're it, saying. It is though, a yeah. fresh experience, yeah. and um, you know, who doesn't like getting access to new things as well, right? It it motivates you to want to see what's over the horizon. One of the, I think, one of the more interesting things that we did on this game was taking those side character stories and chopping them up so that they also got uh, doled out through that meta unlock uh, event so that the beginning, middle, and an end for them exist as well. So you just can't mainline their story. You have an ongoing relationship with them, even though their stories are completely optional. Mm. They're not required to get to the uh, to the credit screen at all. But if you have a heart, I would assume you would <laughs> want to see what happens with Tensei Ishikawa and his, and his student. But we don't force it. We give the player the agency to pick that. Yeah, where where did where did some of the ideas for those come from? Because they a lot of you know Lady Massacre is one. The, so much of this seems to be about uh, uh, you know mentorship and fatherhood and uh, grief and uh, honor to a certain extent as well. Um, where were you picking these stories from? This sounds like an, an almost like an ignorant question to ask somebody. <laughs> where do you get your stories from? Do you, but were they being pulled from you know other Kurosawa works? Are there some stories that are just really endemic to Japanese culture that you felt needed to be in it, or were you pulling it from other places? From the very beginning, we knew that the story was going to be about a samurai who needed to break his code 
in order to save his home from these invaders, that he was going to have to let go of who he thought he always wanted to be to become somebody he needed to be to, to save the people he loves. That story of transformation is the center of the game. And these other characters who meet like Lady Masako or mm. Sensei Shikawa, they take aspects of Jin's transformation and they just turn up the volume on that. See, it's almost like a cautionary tale of what would right. happen should Jin go too far. So Lady Masako is obsessed with getting revenge and she is, we call her murder granny in the studio. <laughs> She's so vicious. And Sensei Ishikawa has a pretty rough relationship with one of his students and he's really a proxy for your mentor in the game, um, Lord Shimura. And so you're, you're, it's looking at Jin's life through many different facets so that his uh, relationship with Shimura and the island is just seen from more perspectives. So we keep going back to the same themes just so that it 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 helps build the understanding of how Jin would feel about himself in the world uh, by virtue of these people reflecting back to him how his choices might uh, ultimately kind of spread out. Right. It's interesting that there I, I'm not a writer and I don't I don't know the first uh, sort of uh, way you approach a character like this but oftentimes in in these uh, games you tend to have a protagonist that's quite I don't know ha- makes a, a very you know strong first impression but Jin is very stoic he 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 he's quite a he's quite an understated character and I think you know as I approached act th- 3 certainly it made those moments of his his difficult moments and his reactions to them, it felt so much more stronger for it, I feel like, because he starts off as such a even keel, like he's got his head on his shoulders. Yeah. What, where was, is that, you know, is that a sort of a storytelling um, um, aspect that you knew you were going to do from the start or? Well, we knew that this character was a samurai who wanted more than anything to adhere to the rules of his class. And one of the, traits that a lot of people think about, uh, especially from watching Kurosawa films, are samurai that have a tight control of their emotions and uh, kind of a very ordered in their thought. And so he needed to represent that very strongly. The person that we cast for the role of Jin Sakai uh, grew up in Japan and he has a lot of that kind of um, emotional uh, control mm. embedded in him. And so when you first meet Jin, he, he is, he's pretty stoic, man, uh, to help project what it is to be a samurai. Of course, that shatters the deeper you get into the story, but he doesn't start as a fountain of emotion. Um, that's what he becomes. Right. Um, Jason, the uh, we talked a little bit about the, sort of how you guided players around that world. Uh, smokestacks was something that um, you mentioned mm-hmm. was a sort of a way to get them, maybe perhaps the points of interest. Uh, one of the things that struck me about the game is that there's always someone leading you uh, to something new, even when you're just riding on your horse. It's almost like a um, from from like underneath you there are foxes, from like just at your high height there are birds, and then above that there are like smokestacks or towers or or things like that. And then, of course, it seems like every once in a while you run into somebody who then just literally gives you a, a ping on the map. Um, how how do you sort of like make it so that players have lots to do without making them feel overburdened? Because by the time you reveal anything in one of those land ma- masses, there's a lot to do. But unlike yeah. a lot of other open world games, I never felt um, like I had like a shopping list that I needed to get to. It didn't feel like a chore. Um, yeah. is, there, is there a method to that? Yeah, you know, I, the, one of the things that we want to do very, very early um, in the speaking, I'll speak first a little bit about the visual direction and then how it manifested into, you know, the actual game design in the game. But very early, uh, we, talking to the R team, like we had, our ambition was like, okay, we're going to make the most beautiful open world game that we can possibly make. Like that was just like, I mean, maybe that's a lot of people's goals, but like <laughs> we're like organizing our, um, stylistic directions and our, you know, the plants that we pick out for the sheer beauty of Tsushima in Japan and making you feel like you're in old Japan so that people will fall in love with this place because we want them to want to save it, right? Well, as that, you know, kind of, you know, came through the years and, you know, it takes a long time to build a place like this and build the tools to build an island like this and then the lighting comes online, you know, 
couple of years into it, we're looking at it, we're like, wow, this, this is, is very pretty. We've, we, I, we, we believe we are going to accomplish this goal. Like we are gonna be very proud of it um, about midway through the game, uh, the game's production. And then you start thinking, well, from a design perspective, I know Nate and I had lots of these conversations, but like, how can we keep you in this world instead of having UI tell you, you know, everything that you're going to do next and, you know, kind of bombarding you with, um, you know, go do this, go do that, go do this, that laundry list of, of things that some games really hinge on and are great, but we didn't feel like it was the right fit for our game. We started coming up with ideas that, would remove some of that noise and keep you in the game world. And suddenly we had people in the studio coming up with foxes that you can follow and birds that'll guide you. Um, the art team was like, oh, maybe we can use smokestacks, you know, to you know show you that there's people in need or help. Um, you know, once we made those clearings, it was like, oh, let you see those shrines that are on the sh uh, that are on top of the mountains. So. Uh, talking to people, we have this, you know, call them criers, like people that want to tell you about something in the world. Um, that system started coming online and, you know, um, we had to tune it because if it's too saturated, you know, you'll get that you know, different problem where you're constantly being told that there's something and that ruins your sense of exploration, which right. we so totally wanted to protect because it's, um, it's very fragile that, that feeling. Cause if it's, if it's, um, if it's too oversaturated with stuff that is told to you, then, I don't why you're already telling me what everything is out there. I don't need to go out there, but if it's too little, then some players may not feel like there's anything at all or they're too lost. How so do you, how very, do you tweak fun. that? Is it, is it just keeping an eye on the last time a player talked to somebody or did something? Is it that type of thing that's going on? Sort of. There's a lot of heuristics under the hood that like try to keep track of, um, you know, we have like limits for how many things can be on the map before we tell you about something else on the map. We certainly have that. But I think the bigger thing that we did that we uh, I'm, I'm really thankful that we we had we started this. But um, on this game, we we play tested the game uh, a lot. And I believe it's like about every six weeks we do kind of, you know, milestone kind of evaluations and we do kind of play tests. Um, starting internal and then as the game progressed we started doing obviously external you know, within sony playtests and that feedback and that data we would look at the maps we would see we had such great logging to kind of understand um, where players went um, how much they found on their own versus what the game told them to find and you're constantly just tweaking numbers right. um, because that magic spot what we wanted because we definitely always wanted that sense of just being lost in feudal japan in mm -hmm. a positive way which oftentimes can be viewed as negative like i'm lost i'm lost i'm lost but just like going on any epic adventure part of it is just like um figuring out what you want to do next and being okay with the fact that you're not you don't know exactly in this moment. Yes, you could go do that awesome story moment, or maybe I heard about that cool mythic mission, but I also am just kind of enjoying the sunset on my ride and I haven't been over here. I'm going to go see what's over here. Right. And that, that took, that took many years, you know, it took, you know, going too far this way and going too far this way to, to land where we ultimately were. It's incredible. I never considered the idea that, um, just because I wasn't, I couldn't, it's almost like out of sight, out of mind because the UI wasn't always telling me that there was that reminded me even just like a micro reminder of this thing i didn't feel overburdened by it or something like that it, it must be difficult to because that's obviously my thing right i bring that to the game that's the way i deal with lists or anxiety or the way i want to play a game or like open world the, the term open world game to me just saying it, it's almost like like there's no point in using it anymore because it's so broad because so many games are open world in so many different ways you know death stranding is an open world game and you know gt you know red dead redemption is a very different experience to this and they're both games where you ride a horse but like you know that's kind of where they begin and end a lot of their um uh, common ground so how do you design do you design open world games, you know, knowing that people are coming with such varied expectations? How do you approach that? Is it the type of thing where you're trying to, you know, placate as many people as possible? Or do you just need to, like, find your lane and say, this is the this is the style of game we're making, uh, and then sort of find the truest version of that and then hope the audience sort of warms to it? Yeah, you know, the... It's a great question. I mean, one of our philosophies on this game is absolutely trying to appeal to a wide audience. You know, we really do want, and that that is from you know difficulty levels down to the you know open world design. Um, 
But at the same time, it's really important to us to try to figure out a way to bring our own thing to the table, our own sense of style that is thematically you know, unified with the game that we're presenting. So I, I do think some of the most important things that we we uh, made adjustments on and you know kind of created were things like you know uh, the wind, you know having the wind guide you from A to B um, or where you want to go next, or using it as a tool as like almost like a, a uh, like a homing device to figure out what you want to actually find, whether it's you know flowers or banners or whatever. Um, that's a that's a it, it's not just an interesting new way to engage with an open world. Uh, you know, you know, systems and, and content and open world, but it's also thematically connected to our game, and that's you know, the, that's where I think the foxes and the birds, you know, leaning into the the nature of 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 the beauty of the world. That's where some of those systems shine. But we absolutely want to make sure that you know, you you, it's it can't be just be like follow the wind, good luck. It actually has to work, you know, because we we this is not just like some hardcore feature. We wanted this like a mainline feature. Um, but it's a it's looking targeting that wide audience, but finding our sort of thematic voice in the process is a huge part of that uh, kind of design process. The, the flip side, I guess, to having a <clears throat> so excuse me um, a big map full of things to do is uh, you need to be rather economical with your storytelling. I imagine Nate, like the every time you go up to somebody, uh, you know these these I forget what term you use, Jason, but the 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 criers, the the people who you know. Yeah. the random punters who are telling you about a quest or something like that um there's a lot of story in this game but uh it was very rare that i felt like there was too much story being told to me um i i, I remember feeling that actually at the start of the game i felt like oh i just want to explore there's there's a lot of like this this intro is quite protracted and i just want to get out there. i think it was like i started playing at 11 at night so i was impatient um but throughout the experience it felt like the storytelling was incredibly economical like you kind of get in and out and those uh those interactions and those conversations f were great they felt um uh you know uh, very satisfying to to watch and listen to it, how does that work in terms of your process are you you know a lot of game design is going back and iterating and changing things and tweaking things does that happen with writing as well do you go back a lot and sort of rewrite retool these interactions um or 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 is that not the case we absolutely iterate on all aspects of the product, uh, from the pace of missions to uh, how long conversations are, generally trying to cut them down to get players back on the sticks. That's the term we use, uh, you know, back into interactivity as much as possible. Um, and that that is occurring on all aspects of the game, from uh, a mainline uh, gin mission to a shrine climb that's just a activity you can find that's a bit of a palate cleanser where mm. it's just climbing because it's fun to climb and the views are great. But even those will go through four big changes as we build them and the systems become more mature. People have an idea to make them better. It's a, it's a constant change is a constant. Right. Yeah. The, uh, yeah, the shrines I've enjoyed how much more difficult they've gotten in the third act. Um, a lot more using that, the, the swinging ropes and whatnot. Um, that whole fluidity, um, the, uh, one of the things that I love about this game that I haven't seen too much reporting on. So it'd be cool to dive into is, uh, just the motion of it. Like everything is just so smooth. Um, it, and, you know, animations, horse movement, all that sort of stuff. Um, and I'd really love to talk about the combat uh, because I really have loved the combat. One of the things that was asked, I think, a lot by people who maybe weren't super familiar with your old games or maybe didn't know too much about this in previews, um, perhaps because of Sekiro as well, they were wondering, oh, is it like a Souls game? Is it like that type of combat? Um, and of course, it's not a it's it's not one of those types of game but i found it satisfying in a very similar way like the countering the stances the use of different types of uh um you know weapons against different enemies um again it never made me feel overburdened but it kept me engaged i have just I, I most games i don't really enjoy going after um you know mob after mob or taking over outpost after outpost but i just love fucking 
chopping people up in this game so much. Um, how did you come to this? Because you're not necessarily a studio that people would like, you know, melee. You're, you're sort of worked on a lot of ranged combat over the years. It must have been quite a challenge to to really dive into melee and to do such a good job of it. How did, how did that all come about? Our ambition is to let you feel like you're a samurai in a samurai film. So we look at these movies that like 13 Assassins in particular is one we really love. And you have to identify the tonal targets, frankly, first. Um, things like um, stillness, you know, that your hero isn't moving around, swinging his sword, that he is just lasering his attention onto his opponent. And then with a flick of his wrist, killing people with one blow honoring the lethality of the sword was important. Otherwise, it was like two medieval knights just wailing on each other for 10 <laughs> minutes. And once you kind of have those tonal melee targets, that's really the start of, of everything else. We built out from there with uh, moves that helped celebrate that. So a perfect parry where you wait and you're thoughtful to get the advantage on an opponent is a great way of honoring the samurai theme because you're not just flailing, you're, you're being thoughtful. Having that North Star of make it feel like a samurai film really is was the beginning. And I think the, the, the measure through which we viewed our success. It's very handy using that as an organizing principle really for everything. Um, you know, what kind of activities do you see in the open world? Uh, let's, let's put bamboo chopping in because that's what Samurai do to practice. That is the, the root that dictates the sorts of stories, the sorts of activities that we're doing. And I think melee, it's the most pronounced. Right. Yeah. The, the, it must have been quite challenging to make uh, battles that involve so many people feel that way, feel intentional when there's no flailing. Um, is there a lot of work going on behind the scenes to make you, you know, hold back people or one one thing i found interesting was that you know uh the only ranged uh you know antagonist uh well except i guess for the later gun stuff but the 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 archers will always give you that little telegraph so you know yeah. that you're going to get hit um but everyone else uh, in fact the dogs are the only ones that don't care the dogs will just come at you no matter what the <laughs> fuck. yeah which is really cool because then i noticed like oh that's not the case with all the other enemies they always take their they take their turn. How do you how do you create a combat system where I'm taking on these huge groups of people, but it doesn't feel like that weird movie thing where everyone else is standing back and they're coming at me one after one? That like annoying trope. It it because it doesn't feel that way. Right. Uh. Well, you just gotta play balance it, like Jason was saying with uh, how much content do players want to get at a time. The same is true with uh the villains. So they actually more aggressively come at you one after another after another if you play it on a harder difficulty. Mm. If you're playing it on an easier one, they will hang out a little bit more to give the player more time to eyeball the next villain and respond to their attack. Um, it's that level of comfort that you have as a gamer to juggle and dance between all these incoming attacks is what makes the game feel good. But you have to have a dance partner that's at your level or it doesn't feel like a dance it just feels like a beatdown. right why can't i parry dogs though i just want to parry dogs <laughs> no <Noted. laughs> um i feel bad every time i kill one of those by the way but then you gave me so many predator hides that i don't feel bad anymore <laughs> it, all, it all works out in the end um did you ever have more than seven bamboo strikes no no seven's the max uh yeah. frankly it it Bakes my noodle to try and memorize seven numbers as it is, or symbols. I'm at the absolute limit of my intellectual capacity. I don't know about you. Seven is like seven is definitely the sweet spot because six is too was felt like the five one felt like oh this is easy and seven especially in the later ones I was like oh man this kind of sucks like I just want to like I'll, I'll feel I'll feel very good uh, you know it's it's hard enough that I'll actually feel like this was worthwhile but please don't have another one because there's no way my oh, brain man. can take the next it's one. It's crazy, right? Doing three buttons, you're like, ah, oh, no problem. Yeah. Five, still no problem. Somehow adding in two more, 
that's the limit of human beings. Yeah, it's like or the like the edge of what a human being can do. <laughs> it's like that whole like you can only remember two hundred faces thing or something. You know, like you can only remember a certain amount of books you've read. It's like eight symbols and then the whole society falls apart. Yeah, it's why yeah. our it's why our pins are only four numbers, I guess. Or social security numbers. Jason, I didn't get to talk to you much about the combat stuff. Um, there's a you know a, a cleanness to the art, obviously, in terms of the um, the parrying and the dodging necessities. You guys telegraphed that very clearly. Um, but was there a lot of challenge again in, in trying to hone that down to try and make things, you know, silhouetting and try and make it so the players knew exactly what was going on, what type of moves were coming? Because there's a lot going on in those fights. Yeah, as Nate as Nate mentioned, since we knew we were going to go for you know this this dance, that uh, you know so many things have to work well for you not to feel just like kind of frustrated and the game cheated you, which sucks. Like nobody right. wants that. We want to we, if you fail and you die, we want it to because you feel that you made a mistake or um, you didn't make the right choice at the right time. It's so much better. And so you know you know camera, lots and lots of conversations about how does the what has the camera work different if you're only one or two guys it's much much it pulls back a little bit if it's you know more than i can't remember the number but four or five it starts kind of pulling back if there's a guy behind you or off camera it tries to make uh choices that look good still but are more um helpful for you during that kind of dance right but certainly a lot of our time was spent um in the both in the hero animations like how because we ultimately we want you to feel like an amazing samurai um, in this dance, uh, and, and also that those, uh, attacks from the enemies are cleanly, um, legible, um, and that there are, um, the windows, which, uh, Nate, correct me if I'm wrong, but the windows of pairing, the pairing windows actually change with dif difficulty levels. They do. Um, yeah. So, you know, what that guy does when he's winding up has to read very clearly, um, because we don't want to just rely on um you know the little flare that comes out we want you to maybe to be able to anticipate it a little bit before that the little you know little flare that pops up is just there to help but one of the things i think is um the most successful at least for me when i play the game um the, the combat is the impact feeling it doesn't have um you know, this is really important that we didn't have this feeling of just like slicing through people and that was kind of it like you're just you're like hitboxing or whatever like it, for us it was using this um, linked animation where I hit a guy and like he parries it a certain way, tandem based animation style. Uh, it's, 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 it's not an easy decision because uh, you do lose a lot for doing that. You lose time, iteration. It's no more complex because these two people have to actually link up. But the benefit you get on the other side is this like nitty gritty, we say mud, blood and steel. And it becomes that way, right? Because you, parried that guy and it feels like you hit his sword and moved it to the side or um, when you get hit it feels like somebody sunk their sword into you and vice versa and that um, I think that stylistic choice which we made very very early um, was an, an um, incredibly good decision for us in the end to really deliver that the style of the combat that I think we have right yeah the, it goes back to what Nate was saying I guess about like honoring the the power of a sword you know it doesn't mm -hmm. feel like something you're just flapping around, which I guess, you know, we go back, there's a lot of samurai games uh, have come out over the past <clears throat> 20 years and a lot of them are about clearing out large amounts of people with, with, with relative ease. Um, can we talk a little bit about then the amount of uh, other weaponry? Because I, I was actually quite surprised that when it comes to these games, I get quite intimidated by a lot of um, combat systems. And at the current stage I'm at in the game, not only are there four stances I'm using, I have two different arrows which have multiple, you know, things on them. And then I also can throw a bunch of stuff, some of which are like explosive, some of which are more stealthy ones. And then, of course, I can go in stealthy, which is cool because I loved all those Tenchu games. But then actually I can just like click in my two sticks and just murder a bunch of people um, with this visual effect. Like there's so many ways you can approach it and also every you get everything it, it's not like you choose an unlock path and you go down the samurai world and you get all the you know ninja weapons or you go this way and you get all those how do you even start to introduce that stuff without overburdening the player like how do you find that sweet spot where the players can use this stuff if they so feel but again kind of like the map stuff you're not just beating them over the head with it and making them feel like there's this 
inventory that they're not using. Having those abilities come online for the player over time is what helps keep the game fresh and alive. You get used to fighting a certain way. Oh, I always parry. But then you get the kunai and you realize you can throw these knives in people's faces and stun a group of them and then jump in and uh, attack. And so you go from being kind of a, a, a wait to react player to aggressive player. By getting these new tools, it oper opens up an opportunity to just have a new play experience. That's why we wanted you to get them. That's why they come out slowly over time so that you start looking at the game through a whole new lens of what is possible. Um, that move you talked about where you, you click the two sticks, that one in particular uh, puts a real emphasis on, hey, stealth can be your best friend here for actually clearing out these people. Where early on, it's not really the best option. It's better just to go in and sword fight. And these mechanics are there uh, not only to give you a fresh experience, but also to help reflect the transformation that Jin's going through so that you become more comfortable with these uh, kind of low down attacks, these, these stabbing from the shadow type moves because it is uh, more rewarding and it's more uh, effective. And it just wasn't part of a repertoire when you started. Right. Are, are, you, are you intentionally trying to get players to play the game you know, stealth stealthily if they're if they have been mostly going in, you know, aggressively and vice versa. Like, because I felt like a lot of these weapons were sort of bridges into play styles that I hadn't considered. Absolutely, the game is uh, telling one story: the samurai who becomes the ghost, and the ghost uses all these dishonorable moves, you know, like poison darts. And so we're giving you these disarmable attacks as you get deeper and deeper into the story because that's the kind of thing that Jin Sakai is accepting as necessary. And as a player, these are your new ways to express yourself in a growingly more difficult uh, environment where you, you need every advantage you can get. Right. Um, uh, there's been a lot of talk about Kurosawa mode. Obviously, the photo mode has been uh, uh, wonderful to see people using it so much. Um it was. It felt like a real one-two punch again. The Last of Us too. There was so much great photo stuff coming out of that. Um, and then you know, who doesn't want to be a, a director of photography on a on a Kurosawa movie? Um, but I want to talk about the black and white, like that mode, right? Because it's not just a case. At least in film, I you know, there are movies that are shot to black and white. Like Mad Max Fury Road is a is a great movie in color, but it was actually filmed by Miller to be uh, readable in black and white. And it's not necessarily a case of just throwing an Instagram filter on a game. So I wanted to know, Jason, what, what were the like challenges in making sure that Kurosawa mode worked? Because color is such an important part of the palette of this game. Uh, and tearing it out, you obviously lose a lot. So how do you keep you know those elements that were, were sort of leaned on color um, still present in a, in a black and white environment? Yeah, in any other game, uh especially one that we set out to uh, from the visualization, the stylization of the game. We really wanted to push bold colors. You know, how can we get you to remember the golden forest? Well, I can tell you it's not just to create like a realistic browns and autumn -y colors. Like let's just make it gold. Like let's really push those yellow colors and just burn that into your memory. Any other game taking that out and doing like a black and white mode would have probably sunk my soul. <laughs> but considering what we're making and, um, you know, the inspiration that uh, Kurosawa had on all of us uh, as, you know, game makers, storytellers, uh, cinematographers, it's it was a, it was sort of a joy to jump into it. But there were definitely some challenges, uh, especially designing the game as like this beautifully colorful thing. Um, there's certainly some design challenges with uh, as soon as you turn to black and white, some features just don't work. And we had to redesign some icons. We had to redesign some stuff in the map um, to make it work. Um, but uh, the the really interesting part was, um, you know, it isn't just like a filter. You know, it is in terms of, you know, you've got to get the lighting and the color right first. And then then we apply as a post effect these these changes. Um, but you know, if you just put a black and white curve on it or whatever, um, or a black and white filter on it, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't think that would have done, actually, I know it wouldn't have done, done a good enough job because we tried it. And that was the first thing you try is just like, <laughs> where, where does that, what does that get us? Um, 
but the challenge is is that our game as you've played enough of it you can you'll see this is that there's daytime there's nighttime there's overcast there's indoor outdoor under tree canopy inside of fields next to fires like pretty much because it's an open world game every lighting scenario that you could ever possibly imagine exists so we can't just look at one kurosawa film and try to study the film curve and the, the black levels and the white levels you have to pick a ton of scenes daytime nighttime indoor outdoor next to fire try to find as many that we can sample from um we even we even did do some research into the actual film curves and you know color curves the time to try to understand our hdr tone mapping curve and see if we can replicate it um, and then, and, and after looking at all of that and trying to apply the right type of filter that gets as many of those black levels and those white levels, uh, right as possible. And this is, a, this, this became, you know, once we realized that we were going to be going through the Kurosawa estate to, to, uh, get the rights and the ability to use the name Kurosawa mode, then suddenly it, it no longer had to be just like really good. It had to be like perfect. <laughs> so the iteration time, you know, it was like another few weeks of just jamming on this to, until it was, you know, um, something that I could send to them and feel like we, we, we delivered something really great. Uh, so that was kind of the process. Um, the color part is, is, uh, people ask me all the time, like, which one do should I play in first? I do think that if you're, I think that most people should probably play the game in color first. Um, just because unless you're just like this amazing black and white film buff, man, like then, then, then go by all means it's there from the beginning. But, uh, the color is such an integral part of the stylistic direction. So it's, it's a, it's a super nice treat that we have it in though. And it makes the game look super cool when people take photos of it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've, there's a couple of questions I have around this, but I actually want to go yeah. to one of our patrons who sort of tease it up really well. Um, uh, if you want to ask questions, by the way, over on our Patreon Discord, uh, uh, go to patreon.com slash noclip and you'll get access to our Discord. Uh, Grid asks, uh, were there any intentional script changes between the English and Japanese voice tracks for cultural reasons, i.e. jokes or phrases that mm. don't quite make sense in both languages? Yeah, I imagine the idiom parity between English and Japanese isn't exactly perfect. Uh, was there a lot of work being done there to uh, explain things to the English audience or vice versa? Well, a lot of the localization, um, you know, if you're not a, a Japanese speaker, you're not going to know exactly uh, what is being said because the subtitles that you read, if you're an English speaker, are still in English. Um, there is a tremendous amount of work that went into the Japanese localization to actually have the, the language be period authentic as well, which is something right. that if you can't speak Japanese, you're not going to be able to appreciate. But, you know, we hear about this through our localization team and it's spectacular. And I, frankly, as a non-Japanese speaker, I'm really sad that I can't experience the game in that way because it would be another means through which to feel uh, the period come through. Um, but I just don't have access personally, uh, to that. I don't, Jason, are you, you're not a Japanese speaker either, right? No. Is that no, crazy? There's this huge yeah. lush aspect to the game that we don't even get to see. Yeah. Thank God for our localization team that put their heart and soul into this game and, uh, added that extra layer of value for people. Yeah, I mean, even outside of the language stuff, like how did you navigate just the the inherent uh, difficulty, uh, responsibility mm -hmm. as well of, you know, obviously Nate, you're you're very well read, it seems like on on a lot of uh, Japanese uh, folklore and, and clearly both of you are fans of the Kurosawa movies as, you know, many uh, sort of cinema fans in the West, that that's sort of their gateway to a lot of this type of world. Um, but how did you, you know, navigate the, the you know, transforming of this into a game in, in an authentic manner? Um, you know, without being overly tropey or, or, you know, not that I would even be able to pinpoint if something was tropey or not, to be honest. That's sort of how disconnected from what I am. But I imagine, I know you're part of Warward Studios and you have the studio in Japan. Did they help in any respect with that? Or do you have people on staff who are sort of guiding some of those elements? We basically have, uh, well, we, we probably have different experiences, but we basically all, all of those, there's almost an answer, uh, to yes to like, we have, we about very, very early in the project, we got, um, you know, an amazing, uh, Jap you know, he's, uh, used to be a Japan studio producer and now he's a producer for our studio. Um, Yuhei Katami, he, he helped, I like 
on almost every aspect. He helped facilitate, give advice, um, work with Sony Japan on things for us. Uh, you know, where he he's the one that worked out the the Kurosawa deal uh, that we kind of you know gave them you know, review the review kind of uh, work. Uh, this guy is transformative in terms of like being able to work on a game like this. Let alone we do uh, work with multiple types of cult cultural con uh, consultants. Um, uh, judging our art, you know, judging, I know we have like somebody doing script review. I know Nate had somebody down at mocap kind of just making sure that people were standing, uh, not too close to each other and invading personal space. Wow. Um, and, uh, we even use like Sony Japan, um, did, um, uh, did like field recording for us. Cause they're already in Japan. They could just go out and do like actual sounds of deer, which by the way, I, the first time I heard the deer in the game, I thought it was somebody screaming. I didn't know that deer sounded like this and they yeah, yeah. recorded these things. And so uh, we kind of, we were super lucky to be part of, you know, worldwide studios and have so many partners uh, immediately available and excited to help us. It was, it, was, uh, it was a big part of being able to get this game off the ground. All right. You mentioned the deer as well. Now do you mention a, you, you can't skin the deer, right? They're not. Yeah. Which, which again, that's a Japanese thing as well, right? Cause they revere. Yeah. 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 That's we, interesting. We try to, yeah, we try to, you know, that, you know, we, you know, again, we get feedback, right. And then we get feedback that like, Hey dear, like they're very special here, you know? And so we don't give you any incentive at all for, for killing the deer in the game. Right. Uh, what was the, what was it like, uh, seeing the reaction from, uh, you know, uh, artists and creators in Japan? Cause I imagine that must've been especially special to hear, you know, some of the quotes are coming out from people saying like, it's incredible that someone, you know, in the West was able to make a game that was so personal t uh, to us. What was that like? And, you know, get it. What was your, do you know what, you, what was your Famitsu review? <laughs> when, uh, Jason, I don't know about you, but when we got news that we had achieved this perfect score with the Famitsu review, I just felt such an incredible sense of relief that we hadn't, messed it up. You know, our, right. our intention was to deliver a feeling of authenticity. We know we're not recreating Tsushima stone for stone, but we didn't want to ruin somebody's uh, time playing the game by just making bonehead moves that that misrepresented the, the culture in a way that, that ruined the immersion. And to find out that it was working for uh, people that had grown up in that culture, it, it felt so good to to just know like oh man didn't mess it up which was which was my personal fear i just didn't want to yeah totally yeah. it was very heartwarming it was it was it was it was uh you know you set out i mean games are already hard to make at just in general anybody's ever worked on one or you know looked at them or just played them and tried to understand the scope they're super hard to make and then you throw this extra layer of you know really wanting to you know, understand the culture of, you know, a, another place and, uh, you know, history of another time. And you, you really, you really want that stuff to come through in the end. You really hope that it does. Cause you spend a lot of effort in it. And, and honestly, it's probably some of the most important stuff. Um, so I was, I was very you know, much like Nate. I was, I felt a sense of relief, but also just jo joy that, um, people like, you know, Yuhei who helped us so much on this game right. can feel maybe a sense of pride instead of, you know, doubt or something like that or regret like and, and it just that was a great feeling yeah and the reaction from uh, fans seems to be pretty uh, uh uh fantastic as well i was reading um articles saying it was the highest you know i tend as i used to work for GameSpot, so i tend not to lean on metacritic all that much but you know they i think it has the highest review score of the generation um at the moment and of course it's sold incredibly well as well were you surprised by how well it's been received or how well it's sold or or the fan reaction? I, I, I don't know. As, as somebody who makes things, I find it impossible to tell if something is good by the time I finished making it. Uh, what yeah. was your sense throwing it out into the world? Um, are you surprised by how sort of you, unanimous the love seems to be in, my, in many ways? Well, for me, Nate, I would love to hear Nate's thoughts too. I, I, I feel like... Uh, you know, you work on something this long, there is an aspect of it that you just stop losing perspective. And so you just have to trust your instincts and trust your, you know, creative, you know, judgment and your team's, um, you know, motivation. And like, you know, obviously you get little moments every now and then from like feedback from play tests and you're like, oh yeah, we're onto something still, you know, we were still on the right path, but you really just put it out there and you just got to be okay with whatever happens as much as, you know, you just could be 
if you can put something out there that you are proud that you what you've created, you, know, you step away from it and be like, this is something that I will remember as a very positive journey. It was very it was very positive. And for me, that was true. You know, step, you know putting it out there, not knowing what people were going to think. You hope and you pray and you kind of like you know, mm. cross your fingers. But ultimately, um, really proud of the team and really proud of everyone that contributed to it and all the friends that we made along the way. But you lose perspective a little bit over you know many many years of working on something. I found that the release of this game has been a, just a real new experience compared to our past ones where you're too close to it to really know. And then it goes out there and people have reactions and, you know, it's, it feels great. And, you, you know, every criticism you feel in your heart, you, it's very emotionally high and low. But being able to watch people play through the game, watching streamers, it has right. been amazing. You know, we, we make these games and we imagine what it's like for people to be at home playing. You know, we want to bring them joy. Right. right. Is this the first time you've had to experience that? Because it's been like six years since the studio put out a game, right? Yeah. 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 I when, when Second Son came out, I didn't watch people play through, but I've been watching loads of people play through <laughs> Ghost of Tsushima. Uh, most notably, our lead actor, Daisuke Suji, did a full playthrough and it was so fantastic to experience the game through his eyes and seeing what you know made him tense or where he was frustrated that he died or where he teared up. It's such an incredible new way to experience um, video games, particularly as a video game maker, that uh, it, it, at least for me, it really charges me up for you know any future project because you get that much closer to the emotion of of what it is you've done. Right. Is it hard to look away though as well? You know, if you're constantly uh, have this like feed of people who are critiquing your work, is it hard to put the put the twitch down? It's it's tough uh, to not be curious what people think, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you want to listen to people's criticisms and you want to learn what really got them excited and put that in your pocket and go forward into whatever you're doing next to double down on what made people really happy. Excellent. Um, well, whatever it is that's next, um, I'm sure a lot of people are, are looking forward to it. Uh, Nate and Jason, thank you so much for your time today. Um, what are you, what are you doing in your day to day today? Have you managed to play any, uh, any other games, any stuff that was in your backlog for 2020 that you didn't get to while you were working on the game? What, what are you enjoying at the moment? Well, uh, we might be doing both the same thing right now. Actually, uh, what I'm doing right now is I'm actually playing through the lethal mode of our game on retail. <laughs> so being playing a game on retail is very, very different, right? Like everything is done. It's out there. So I'm actually doing, I'm going to platinum it. That's, that's my, <laughs> my next plan. And then I, I definitely have a stack of amazing games that I need to, uh, go back through and and uh, and, and play because there's some there's been some great games that have come out over the years. So, what about yourself, Nate? Uh, I'm actually going through a retail playthrough of Ghost on Lethal as well, <laughs> uh, which is fun. Uh, but I would do a special shout out. I've just had the best time playing through uh, Last of Us Part Two. Mm -hmm. I think that they are so inspiring at how they raise the bar, particularly on interactive fiction. It's such a good time to be a video game player when games like that come out because they they show you what's possible in the medium. Do you get do you, between you guys? We talked to Herman before about back when he was at just a, a, at Gorilla about you know the amount of cross collaboration between the the Sony studios. Uh, all of, all three of you have great snow you know snow tech like footprints tech. Was there any shared knowledge going on there? Yeah. I, uh, being part of being part of uh, Sony and uh, Worldwide Studios this long, it's always awesome to see something in one of the other games and be like, "Hey, do you know the person there that we can talk to?" And then get the two graphics people talking or the two artists talking, and uh, it's been awesome. I don't know if there was any particular snow tech, but there, we definitely shared ideas and philosophies and did little presentations back and forth. We visited Sony Santa Monica and like looked at their character development after they made God of War, which is like freaking amazing. The characters are just insane. The art is amazing. Um, so we, we, we brought some of our character artists down there and looked at stuff. So there's definitely a lot of cross collaboration, which is a huge part of uh, benefit of being part of these studios. 
Excellent. Well, gentlemen, I really appreciate your time today. Uh, thank you both for, for taking the time to talk to us about Ghost of Tsushima and best of luck uh, with what comes next. Thank you. Cheers. Awesome. Hey, pleasure talking to you. Pleasure, yeah. And yeah. and thanks to everyone for, for listening to us here on the on the No Clip podcast. We are at No Clip Video on Twitter. I'm at Danny O'Dwyer on Twitter. You can support the show at patreon.com slash no clip and get access to a bunch of goodies. And you also support all of our work making documentaries too. Uh, our next episode is uh, <laughs> in some ways another uh, Western take on rich Japanese heritage. We've got the folks from Fall Guys coming on, uh, which is my favorite version of Takeshi's Castle I've ever played. So, uh, I look forward to talking to them next week and I look forward to you listening as well. We'll see you then. Have a good week. Take care.